Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Thanks for joining me. My name is Ezekiel Gentle and you are on the Ezekiel Gentle channel. If you haven't yet, go ahead and subscribe. And by the end of this video, drop a comment with your thoughts about what you saw here today. I wanted to share an update on the book I'm reading, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, because it ties in directly to what we've been talking about in regards to my departure from Christianity. Now, one thing I want to kind of tee up before we get into the content is that I didn't necessarily deconstruct in the sense that I recanted my faith and said, oh, I'm never going to believe this again. In fact, it was over the course of time and investment that I finally came to terms with different realizations about my own faith. Now, I know an initial video I had is why I'm leaving Christianity, but the reality is you can't really leave Christianity. You can't really leave any of these belief systems because if they were ever truly installed for you, then they are now part of frame, part of your paradigm, even if they're not exclusively the one thing you believe to be true. So a therapist helped me realize that I actually didn't lose my faith. I built upon it. And the reason I think that's so important is our ability to believe in the unseen and our ability to put our investment, our hope, our trust in something that we can't see is paramount to our survival, not just in the physical realm, but the survival of our soul. If we're going to have meaning and purpose and get to the end of this life with feeling good, feeling accomplished, feeling like, man, you know what? I did everything I could. I did everything I wanted to. Um, then it's going to help us. It's going to help us achieve that goal by acknowledging those intangible values. I'll give you a quick example before I get into some of the other stuff I was going to share from the seven habits of highly effective people. And that's where I am right now. You may notice it's a different background. I'm uh, currently with family on holiday, so I hope your Christmas is amazing. Um, today is Christmas Eve, 2023. And the thing about meaning and purpose is that we often find it in the abstract. We often find things in the obscure, in the mundane even. And we had the privilege of seeing Cirque du Soleil. Now, if you've ever seen a show like Cirque du Soleil, you know that there's there are acrobats, there are dancers, there are singers, musicians, instrumentalists, all kinds of different creators who are coming together to make this incredible performance that's not just well thought out, but it's cohesive, it's a part of a bigger whole. And the thing that really struck me is that there are no words, there are no props, there are no, there's absolutely nothing referential, there was no sexuality to it, there was no villain. There was no peril. And I think the reason it struck me is because we typically think of stories in these frames where there's a villain and then there's a protagonist. There's a hero and there's a guide. Um, and that hero needs the guide to get over some impossible hurdle so they can achieve some great success and avoid some perilous failure. It's typically true. But when you get into things that are abstracted from that, you start to find that it's natural, it's in our nature to imbue some meaning. It's in our nature to put ourselves in what we're seeing. And that's no different than Christianity in the way that we view the world. Whatever story we know, whatever mythology, whatever religion, that needs to be used. It needs to be used to see ourselves in our world because the sooner we can have a kind of avatar reality where we see, okay, in our case, if we're talking about Christianity, it's like, okay, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. What does that mean for my life? And it doesn't mean replicate. It doesn't mean mimic. Oh, I need to do the exact same. And I think that's where a lot of us go wrong. We're like, oh, well, Jesus did that. And I was taught from the pulpit to believe this conclusion from his action. Therefore, I'm going to do it like that. Well, it's not really fair because what one person did may have meanings that are different for other, for other people. Just because you heard a teaching on one Bible verse in one way doesn't mean that's the interpretation. It doesn't mean that's the conclusion. And the sooner we can make our own conclusions about some of these things, the sooner we're going to be empowered to live a life authentically and with purpose and with meaning. So to bring it to the seven habits of highly effective people, I already shared a video of the first hundred pages where we talk about habit one, which is be proactive. You're the creator. You are the one who's making things happen or not happen. And if you're not making things happen, you're reacting. 
So if you haven't taken the time to take a pen to a piece of paper and write what you want about life, most likely you're going to be reacting and responding to what's happening around you instead of being the originator of what's going on. Number two was begin with the end in mind. When you visualize something all the way to the end, it allows you the opportunity to backtrack and reverse engineer those steps required to get to the end that you really want instead of being on your heels hoping that you end up at some divine outcome. Number three, which is where I am right now, is to put first things first. And if you're enjoying this, like the video, drop a comment, let me know what you think about this type of format where we're talking about kind of famous books and relating it to our paradigms and life views, things like that. So this thing about put first things first, at least in the book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, goes into this idea that we're all centered on something. You are centered on something, I'm centered on something. And that thing that we're centered on, it, it may be a part of what our, our childhood led us to believe, it may be a part of what social media has led us to believe, but there's an opportunity for all of us to decide what that thing is, to determine what we're centered on. And here's the uh, path that the author kind of takes you through. He starts to really paint you a picture of these different things you can be centered on. You might be others-centered, always wanting to serve other people, make sure everybody else feels good, being a people pleaser, being a nice guy. Or you may be somebody who's actually centered by family. So it's not that everybody is getting this version of you, but you're giving the people around you the passivity required to kind of placate whatever their desires are. And this list goes on and on and on. You could be centered on your community, where you're always serving your community. You're neglecting those closest to you. You're neglecting yourself. Uh, you could be centered on things like possessions. Okay, if I make more money, if I get more things, I'll be happy, I'll be happy, I'll be happy. All of these things do, what all of these things do is create a carrot and a stick situation where the carrot's dangling off the end of the stick and the stick continues to move. So we never actually get the carrot. It's being pushed out in front of us and yet we think that we're getting closer. But the reality is all of these things aren't inherently bad. It's not bad to think of other people. It's not bad to put other people first. And it's definitely not bad to center your, or to put you know, your family, your community on a high level of priority. Here's where it becomes a problem. When that becomes what you are centered on, your value begins to get derived from that that puts your pow the power of you being happy and satisfied in other people's hands. So the solution is not to avoid all of these things, which is, I think, one of the things we're kind of doing as a society right now. We're saying, like, oh, it's bad to be centered on church. All right, no more church. Never again. Never will I be faithful at all. And it's like, well, that's not really the solution. The solution is probably something more like, how can you find the value you got from there without making it the thing that you live or die by. I think if we take down the pressure and the intensity of some of these situations, we can find more value, more meaning, more purpose. So the way that we adjust this is we, dis we determine the principles of these things and we center ourselves on the principles. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, if serving your partner is your number one thing in life, my wife or my husband is like my number one priority always and ever, I'll always make sure they're good no matter what, even if it takes me sacrificing myself i get i get that i really get that but what if there's a way for you to isolate the principle of putting them first the principle of self-sacrifice of loving with an action then you can accommodate that same behavior without making it the prerequisite for your own happiness or the reason for you to be satisfied with life. One of the things that keeps us from being able to feel good is putting others in control of our emotions. When the reaction of my significant other is the reason that I feel good, I'm beholden to them. They're, they are my God at that point. And it's actually even more than that because even with your relationship to your higher power, to God, you rely on that other receiving message to be happy, to be satisfied. You will constantly be searching for this thing. Maybe you get it every day, maybe you get it every other day, whatever, but the point I'm trying to make here is it's the principles of these things that allow us to get the results we want in our life without being so rigorously tied to a 
other people, and external sources for validation. The sooner we can validate ourselves, the sooner we can go to a place internally, whether it's with our eyes closed or open, listening to a podcast or meditation, whatever, but where we can begin to really talk to ourselves, talk ourselves either kind of off the edge if we need to kind of come down from something really intense, or to just deploy self-compassion, just to deploy a little bit of empathy towards ourselves, where it says, you know what, I don't, I don't, and you can start with just the facts. I don't feel good about this thing. I wish I hadn't done that thing. And then realize that you're human. See your human context and really be, be able to give yourself that, that compassion, which is to say, but you know what, even though I wish I hadn't done that thing, I know why I did it. I was stressed. I was frustrated. I was going through a lot. Allow yourself to understand what you were experiencing. One of the things we do when we're centered on external sources instead of being centered on principles is that we will often make we will often make these stories remove the humanity from our perspective. And what I mean by that is saying we will sometimes tell if we're telling, let's say, a family member about something that happened that we're not proud of. There are two ways to kind of present that. You can present it in a way where there's a vacuum for a conclusion, where the vacuum is saying like, hey, I'm not really going to contextualize this or give it character. I'm just going to tell you what happened. And we're both going to kind of know how you feel about it. The other, which is to give them the power, to give them the opportunity to validate you or invalidate you. Also, if you can hear the birds, I don't know whether to say I'm sorry or you're welcome. Um, they sound beautiful here, but hopefully on this mic, they're not, they're not too loud. The other thing you can do, though, is tell the story Tell what happened, and instead of leaving that open-ended for them to, to, to determine whether it's good or bad and to conclude, one of the things you could do, tell the story and then share your humanity. Share the actual human experience. Don't just write yourself off. You know, Tell them what you were thinking and feeling at the time. Hey, yeah, this thing happened, and you know, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize I was really stressed at that time. I was really going through a difficult time personally. How often do you and I totally neglect the fact that we are actually conscious human beings who are having our own experience? It's not just a results-driven world. If this world were driven by results exclusively, truth would be a high value. One thing I'd recommend, the Jeff Bezos and Lex Friedman podcast. Jeff Bezos talks about this fact that humans aren't truth-seeking animals. We're social animals. And that rings so true to me because if you look in churches and you look in the places where we've gone for truth the social element overtakes that pursuit every single time the social reward system of having a community meeting new people maybe going on dates maybe finding mentors maybe finding friends all those things begin to kind of creep up and overtake this notion of truth when we're seeking the truth we're on a different path than when we're just by default living our life so if you will begin to tell the stories of when you fell short without that negative context of saying like you know, beating up on yourself like yeah i really wish i hadn't done that i'm so whatever allow yourself for a moment to share your humanity with somebody else and say you know i right wrong or indifferent i overreacted and i overreacted because i was in a situation where i had really been removed from my usual thought processes. I was changing. I was growing. And I didn't really know what the best thing to do was. That was the best I could do. And yeah, I created some of these outcomes that aren't really pleasant. But if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have the awareness I have. So that's one of the ways that when we center ourselves on principle instead of on these external factors, we're able to implicitly see the humanity in every decision we make. So then when we look back and we share stories with other people, and even as we move forward into our own life, we begin to realize, you know, I do have worth. I am worthy of love. I am worthy of expression. I am worthy of connecting with people in a deep way, regardless of what I've done, regardless of where I've been. Because why? I'm a human. I'm a human being. Every single human has fallen short, has made mistakes, has done things they're not proud of. So the sooner you can free yourself, forgive yourself, see yourself as human, and not Give that power to others, not give that power to other people to say, you know what? Yeah, you're okay. It's okay to happen. But instead, find it within yourself, whether it's through your faith system, through your belief system, or through what we're talking about here, which is really outlining your principles. Because the reality is you're already living your principles. 
In areas you're not living your principles in your life, you're compromised. So find the areas you're not compromised, the happiest, healthiest relationships you have. Begin to isolate what, what those principles are. And then allow those principles to be the innermost circle of your being and let your doing come out of that. So that you may do things for other people based on your principles, not based on their demand. One final thing to put a bow on this that the author talks about is this difference between urgency and importance. We often think of things as if they're urgent, they're important. The difference between importance and urgency is really that importance comes from your own mission. When something is deemed important by you, it's because it aligns with a deeper mission and meaning for you. When something is urgent, it's because it's from an outside source being made to appear critical. There are things that are urgent that come up that aren't in our wheelhouse of mission and values, right? Like a friend gets a flat tire and they're nearby, they call us. That's urgent. That's urgent. Is it important? Yeah, it's important. But again, I guess to make that point, it's important because caring about your friends is part of your mission and values. Now, if, if a friend is nearby and they're at a bar and they hit you up, they call you, they text you, hey, come out, we're here, whatever, we want to see you, blah, blah, blah. And they make it urgent. It's not important by default unless seeing friends, hanging out, going to the bar is important to you. It's part of your value system. I'm not making a judgment on that. I think for some people, they have a season of their life where they actually need to be going out and meeting people and talking to people, seeing their friends, investing in those relationships. Then there's a time where it's like, you know what? I know that you're nearby. I love you guys. I'm not coming out. I have things to do. I'm focused on this right now. The difference there is principle-centeredness. You're centered on a principle instead of being centered on these external factors of friends, validation, other people, right? So I really hope this helps. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend reading Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm reading it right now and couldn't recommend it more. I'm over halfway through it, but still have a ways to go. And it's just teaching me a lot about the way I approach life strategically. I have a lot of kind of spiritual context, but the more I get these practical tools for applying knowledge and applying skills to life, to get better outcomes, the happier I am because I feel more empowered to make great decisions, to do things that are best for me. So I hope this helped you. Leave a like, comment, and definitely subscribe to the channel. I'll see you on the next one.